A Brief History of Fair Trade You might know fair trade only as the blue and green symbol on the bottom of your coffee bags. You might have a little more knowledge and already understand the real impact fair trade has on improving livelihoods and communities. But do you know how it all came to be fair trade? There are a variety of perspectives which attempt to pinpoint when exactly fair trade became fair trade. Humans have been exploiting each other for centuries. And in contrast, for centuries, communities have formed, re-empowering themselves or others to fight it. The emergence of fair trade was a part of the transition moving from exploitation towards empowerment. But when fair trade actually began is not completely agreed on. Some say that fair trade began during the 1960s, when alternative trade organizations became popular solutions to issues in the global market. This was around the time that the United Nations began to promote trade, not aid. Others have traced its roots back to the 19th century United States, when abolitionists organized mass boycotts against slave-made products in favor of free produce. Even as early as 1908, the Cadbury Brothers, now Cadbury Chocolate, abandoned old, unethical trading partners for more intimate relationships with Ghanaian smallholder farmers. The reality of those relationships today, of course, have changed. But perhaps a more popular starting point recalls fair trade emerging in the United States after World War II. During the first two decades following the war, fair trade organizations and businesses were started by church groups, NGOs, and alternative trade organizations who sought to lend a hand to European and Latin American refugees and struggling communities. In fact, fair trade has had a very faith-based origin story. Many of the organizations that pushed the movement into the mainstream were faith-based. As fair trade grew among NGOs and faith groups, the movement began to shift away from a focus on charitable giving and more towards an intent to create and support partnerships with producers in the Global South through business. It was around 1946 that a relationship formed between the founder of 10,000 Villages and female Puerto Rican handicraft artisans. Whenever and however your fair trade timeline starts, it is generally acknowledged by many fair trade organizations that fair trade grew considerably following the end of World War II. The next three decades bore witness to the births of modern international fair trade giants such as Equal Exchange, Serve, and Oxfam's first fair trade mail order catalog. By 1969, the first world shops began selling fair trade handicrafts across Europe, and in 1988, the Max Havilar label was created, the first modern third-party fair trade organization to certify goods. Around this time, the world market price for coffee prices fell dramatically, and companies such as Cafe Direct began to jump into the market of fair trade coffee in hopes of supporting those farmers affected. The Fair Trade Labeling Organization, now known as FLO, was established as the umbrella organization meant to connect all businesses, organizations, and producer co-ops operating under a fair trade model. It would eventually branch out into two organizations, Fair Trade International and FlowCert. The establishment of Fair Trade International and FlowCert acted as the defining moment for the fair trade movement. The label eventually made itself distinct by branding itself with the fair trade mark, differentiating it as the most recognizable fair trade labeling organization on the market. Now, there was a paradigm shift from faith-based advocacy through fair trade to ethical values to consumer-centered business. As sustainability became a more popular concern, retailers divided into groups motivated by either faith-based values ethics or business. Social entrepreneurs and businesses interested in fair trade now did so as either a part of their corporate strategy or as part of their fundamental values. As the vision of fair trade's future changed among stakeholder groups, tension mounted. Some groups wanted fair trade to embrace the corporate world. Others wanted the certification to remain only achievable to those who were 100% committed to the system. In 2012, Fairtrade USA left Fairtrade International. 
they had begun trying to tap into an industry 69% controlled by large transnational corporations by converting large coffee corporations to fair trade. Their idea was that the only way to grow the movement would be to bring on more multinationals into the system. Multinationals could bring on a form of market power that small retailers could never do. But to bring in multinationals, standards would have to be adjusted to accommodate complex supply chains. This included certifying large plantations that employed hired laborers and watering down standards. Fairtrade International, against dropping the bar to accommodate, stood by its principles that fair trade supported the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. To add to the tension, there is often also a lot of conflict between small businesses who committed completely to fair trade certified ingredients and large corporations who only sourced a fraction of their products. Even if other fair trade organizations had agreed with Fair Trade USA's perspective, they would have faced backlash both from retailers and consumers. Fair Trade USA did face major backlash after its exit. The entire organization lost its credibility in the global fair trade community. Fairtrade USA's exit created a divide between fair trade retailers in both Canada and the U.S. as businesses tried to adjust to two labeling standards. Eventually, FlowCert re-entered the U.S. as Fairtrade America for retailers such as Ben & Jerry's who wanted to remain a part of the international certification system. Through Fairtrade International Certification's marketing tactics, the international movement has been able to grow year over year reaching 7.88 billion euros in sales in 2016. Recognition of the fair trade label is also growing, now the most widely recognized eco-label worldwide. Since the early 2000s, fair trade organizations began to diversify their certification standards to include packaged and processed goods, sports equipment, clothing, and jewelry. Corporate giants started to dedicate some individual product lines to fair trade. What was once a means to connect impoverished peoples to northern consumers through handicrafts had now become a mainstream global market for ethical goods. However, another phenomenon is occurring within the global fair trade market. Large corporations are now leaving the fair trade system in favor of their own in-house sustainability and certification schemes. So what's next for fair trade? The future is uncertain. But those at the heart of the movement continue to push forward, and the movement remains strong.